Good, yeah, so if I started otherwise later on, it will perhaps interrupt us. Um, yeah, so, so let's start with the introduction. So hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have with us today, Harry Ramanandan Toanina. It's always difficult to pronounce that, so we usually call him Harry. Um, uh, Harry will talk to us today about ligand field DFT, which uh, I guess has been his main topic of, of interest since uh, whenever he started his PhD, which he did from 2010 to 2014 uh, with uh, Claude Doe, one of the, uh, the, the main persons first developing ligand field DFT and also propagating in juice at the University of Fribourg. Uh, and let's see, after that, you. Uh, Harry did a uh, postdoc first at the Paul Scher Institute, uh, Institute, also in Switzerland, and then he moved on a little bit north in uh, in Europe. So went to uh, to Germany, uh, where he had another postdoc at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, and currently you're working as a scientific collaborator on a European project on actinide chemistry, for which we'll learn today that ligand field DFT is an excellent tool to study, uh, in particular, its, its spectroscopic properties. Um, and um, you're doing that at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Uh, so again, a pleasure to have you here today and to talk us through what ligand field DFT is, what you can already do, and what um, it will enable us to do in the future. So Harry, please um, yeah, take it from here. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Fedor. So, uh, thank you for the nice introduction. So, nowadays I am currently in Karlsruhe working on actinides, as uh, Fedor already mentioned. But uh, I was uh, working for most uh, scientific uh, uh, work on ligand field approach and how to use ligand field to solve a practical problem, especially in coordination chemistry. So today I'm going to present the ligand field DFT. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, that should work. I okay. Think. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that works. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this talk, this talk is then uh, entirely practical. Uh, Tool for coordination chemistry, and I'm presenting this also with contribution from the SCM team, and also from uh, Claude Doll from the University of Fribourg, who is in the audience today. Uh, today, yes. So uh, the talk will be merely merely a practical. I'm not going to. Oh, God. I think I just need to take this down here. I'm not going to talk too many aspects, but the practical, how did we get this in ADF and what can we what can we do so far and what are we going, what are we going to develop in the future? So uh, the content of my talk will be uh, this way. So I will, there will be a brief, a very brief introduction of the ligand field method and DFT. And then I will show you some practical examples, but uh, example that we have done in the last five years for the calculation of, uh, of uh, coordination uh, compounds. And then I will go to some future developments that we are planning to, to do in the next uh, two, three uh, uh, years. In principle, my talk is about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then you will go to, will go to do some, some demo in, with, within the ATF queue interface and uh, also with uh, some practical example on transition metal chemistry. So um, why do we need ligand field DFT actually? And ligand field DFT is, is useful for, uh, for metal coordination compound. And coordination compound is always a metal ion, like metals that are from the uh, elements that is here in the periodic table in the red, and some ligands. And this uh, um, metal and uh, ligand coordination compound is, a, is, a, is characterized in principle by uh, 
what we call, what we say open shell electronic structure because there are open shell electrons that are occupying for instance in transition metal chemistry 3d orbitals or in lanthanide actinides 4f or 5f orbitals and in principle standard tft method does not work with this kind of uh, compounds because of a near degeneracy correlation and also a multiplet uh, structure that is arising from this uh, open shell configuration so to uh, uh, calculate multiplet structure or to account for this uh, open shell electronic configuration, we have to define then a mo uh, model effective Hamiltonian. And this model effective Hamiltonian uh, is characterized as follows. And we have always one part inter-electron repulsion, one part spin orbit coupling, and the last one is ligand field interaction. In principle, the electronic repulsion and spin orbit coupling, coupling are treated in atomic way, and the ligand field interaction is a perturbation. This, uh, uh, this uh, uh, effective Hamiltonian is uh, represented, as you can see here in these equations, where we have always parameters, which is in the terms of inter-electron inter repulsion, which is uh, the slatter integrals. You have always parameters for the spin orbit coupling, which is the constant, spin orbit coupling constant here. And then we have always uh, parameters for the ligand field, which is the ligand field parameters here. I noted it here in terms of uh, y uh parameters. So all the coefficients are distorted in the uh, ADF uh, database. And this is uh, specific for a given configuration for uh, lanthanide or actinide, 3D or 4F electrons, for instance, or 5F electrons. And there you can, you have also uh, uh, coefficients for a specific uh, configuration, for instance, for X-ray or uh, 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 X-ray, X-ray or uh, uh, RIGS calculation that uh, we have also in the, uh, in the ADF database. And the parameters that uh, I have highlighted it here in color, uh, in, in, in blue or uh, uh, yellow, have to be calculated from first principle. So this is, the, this is, this is why we need density functional theory. We need this density functional theory to obtain these parameters and we can then follow with a ligand field cal calculation. Yeah, so, the question is now, how do we obtain the parameters? So in principle, we obtain the parameters in two folds. So first of all, we have to do a single point TFT calculation and the single point TFT calculation allows us to select the subspace of the ligand field uh, treatment. The important keyword that you have to, uh, you have to uh, consider here is the symmetry. In the ATF, we use no symmetry for the calculation and then the rep occupations keyword where you have to define the average of configuration. So this average of configuration is to represent the electron configuration at hand. For instance, if you have a 3D n, n is the number of electrons that is in the 3D orbitals, then you have to occupy uh, five IMOs with predominant 3D character with n over five electrons. And similarly, for 4F, with n is the number of electrons in the 4F orbitals, then you have to occupy each IMOs with a predominant 4F character with n over seven electrons. How do we do this you know, practically? So let's say that uh, we have this uh, system of uh, uh, coordination compounds, so manganese F2 crystal structure. And in principle, we are working with a, mo uh, with a molecular cluster model. So you have to take out of this crystal structure uh, a, a, a complex that looks like this. And this is a manganese F64 minus, and the manganese has uh, manganese 2 plus, so if configuration 3D5. So in principle, we can run a TFT calculation based on this structure. And at the end of the day, we obtain the following electronic structure. These are IMO energies for the, for the molecular complex. And we can see that there is IMO energies that is predominantly of 3D manganese character. And they are represented here in, in this uh, molecular orbitals. And we have also uh, uh, fluoride 
uh, IMOs and also uh, down there in energy of some manganese 2P, for instance. So for the manganese orbitals that we have obtained, like predominantly uh, 3D, we have to occupy these orbitals with 5 over 5, why 5 over 5? Because in manganese 2 plus, there is 5 electrons in the 3D orbitals. So at the end of the day, we have this 5 over 5 occupation everywhere in, in, the, in the molecular orbitals. And by doing this, we can extract field potential uh, directly from the energies of the IMOs and also from the again function of uh, uh, of uh, again function. And this ligand field potential parameterized the ligand of uh, Hamiltonian term HLF. So this ligand field potential is a five by five matrix, as we can see here. And we have in in the in the line we have uh, IMO energies, and in the colon we have atomic bases, and for, for atomic basis, for from 3dxy to 3dx square, square minus y square, and you have here energies that are in this uh, here in this case in the diagonal part of uh, matrix only because this is a high octahedral symmetry. And this uh, L, this uh, ligand field potential should then represent the separation of energy between the, the orbitals that we have obtained from the TFT calculation earlier, which is in spectroscopic people always called it 10 TQ for octahedral compounds. And here you can see here the energy difference between them. So that will be um, 0, 0.4 minus 0, 0.6 is one electron volt difference between these two orbitals. This is directly then uh, within the ligand field potential. Then the slatter integrals and spin orbit couplings are uh, uh, calculated from the radial functions of uh, of the molecular orbital. So from each molecular orbitals that we calculated for the manganese F6, that I said before, we can extract radial functions. And here is a description of these radial functions. The dashed line, black dashed line is the atomic one. Then you have these two blue solid line. The first blue solid line here is the radial function that corresponds to the T2J orbitals. There are three of them because there are three orbitals actually that belongs to the T2J. And there is, there is this radial functions, which is for the EJ orbitals, which is here. And there are two of them because there are two orbitals, which is part of the EJ. And in principle, we have two different radial functions in the, in the, in the, in the calculation, but in the ligand field approach, since we are using a central field approximation, we have to average these radial functions so that we obtain this dashed blue line. And from this dashed blue line radial function, which is then a kind of artificial radial function, we obtain the slatter condon parameters that I'm going to show you uh, right now. So the uh, integrals looks like this. We have this FK parameters, which is the double integral, and this is the uh, radial functions for the 3D uh, 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 orbitals. And we did it for a different X. So it includes then fluoride, for instance, like for example before, but in case we don't have fluoride, but chloride and bromide, then we can see if uh, radial functions. So the atomic is still the dashed black line. And then fluoride is green, uh, chloride is red, and bromide is blue. And you see here the different radial functions for different compounds. And we calculated the parameters, which is then the slatter condon F2, F4 in blue and in red in this inset. And you see that for, uh, for each uh, case, the slatter condon parameters are all different and they are reduced compared to the atomic uh, solution. So the fluoride, there is a slight reduction to the atomic solution. For chloride, it is uh, uh, larger, and for bromide, it is even larger. And this actually in indicates uh, what spectroscopic also called the less velocity effect, or in a, so in a certain context, the covariancy of a system, which goes from fluoride to the bromide in this series. So now um, uh, I'm going now to uh, present some examples of application to show you also that what is the actual capabilities of LFTFT in ADF. 
Uh, the first example is on Lontanite 4F, 4F transition. So just to introduce that Lontanite is nowadays uh, well known for lighting technologies or magnets, laser, or also for, for applied for biomedical analysis and imaging for gadolinium, for instance. And that's an example of Lontanites that are specifically uh, used for this Purpose for its test lighting technologies, europium is very well known nowadays for for the right emission of uh, uh, of, of FF transitions, and uh, for 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 this we are trying to develop uh, then the TFT code that is giving us some insight about the energy levels and also the multiple structure that is uh, responsible of this lighting properties or magnetic properties of these compounds. So the, uh, from the lighting uh, technology, as I said before, the uh, equivalent lanthanide ion thrusting from, for, for example, tulium, terbium, dysprobium, europium are widely used uh, uh, in this purpose for, uh, for their uh, really nice uh, emission, which doesn't really change in terms of uh, the coordination of uh, lantanate ion. Europium is known for the right emission and it really in the right, and you always see this right emission for, for, for many compounds. And for that, we I wanted to show you our calculation of this compound, which is this uh, europium ion free phenotrolin. So European free plus, uh, the, the, the ground state is a 4F6 electron configuration. And uh, the ground state in terms of Russell Saunders coupling is accepted F. And then uh, this ground state split into components because of spin orbit coupling, which is then at the end of the day, we obtain terms from septet F0 to septet F6, uh, 49. Uh, energy levels in total. And then uh, the ligand field interaction will split once more all these terms into ligand field manifold. And what is nice with this compound is that experimental data are available, so it's good to validate the theoretical method. So uh, we did this calculation with LFDFT and in this table, you can see the energy levels that we have calculated for different DFT functional here and here is the experimental values that is reported also in the literature and here in here in this colon are the percent error that came from the LFDFT if compared to the experiments and we see that uh, most of the levels are relatively good in terms of uh, magnitude I will say there are nonetheless uh, some quite big percentage error. For instance, when you do PBA calculation of the first level, which is, we have 27% error. And when you change the functional, then it reduces a little bit the percentage error, but we still have quite a uh, 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 significant error, like 7% in case of PBE zero. And we have also here, uh, uh, some bigger or like for instance here 57 for 19 percent but this is not systematic because most of the levels are let's say below the 10 percent or even five percent uh, error in the in this situation and most importantly uh, oh sorry most importantly the transitions that is really important in europium is this transition from quantity zero to the septet f2 because this gives the uh, right luminescence that we have always in European compounds. And this in PB0 is, is between 642 nanometers in this case. And experimentally, it's uh, it's relatively close, 630, I think, nanometers that, uh, that they uh, obtain from the uh, emission spectrum. So we see here from this calculation that the LFDFT approach is already giving a very good, uh, very good data for uh, for uh, for europium 4f 4f transitions in, in this case uh, my second example is how to calculate 4f 5d transitions so here in this uh, in this example we did a calculation for uh, europium 2 plus not 3 plus but 2 plus this time and this europium uh, two plus ion is uh, sandwiched with this uh, uh, C9H9 uh, ligands. 
And a principle of the approach looks like this. So you use a, a, a light to excite electron from the 4F to the, to the, uh, to the 5D. So in, first of all, you have to consider the current state configuration of the europium 2 plus, and this is about uh, uh, 4F7 multiplet manifold, which is split into uh, octet S, octet P, so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, we have uh, 3,432 single determinants in this system. And then when you excite one electron from the 4F to the 5D, then you have to account then for the 4F651 electron configuration, and this gives at the end of the day many spectral terms, which in total is about 30,000 uh, single determinants. But we can calculate this with ligand field DFT in, uh, in, in ADF. And this is the active subspace that we have considered in this situation. So here is a simple electronic structure of, uh, of, uh, of a compound, this uh, europium C9H92. And you have here in the right the four F orbitals with a percentage character of each orbitals, and these are occupied then with seven electrons in the ground state and with six electrons in the excited states. And uh, the symmetry is quite high in an H, so that's why you have degeneracy in, the, in some of the level. And you can you, you can see here that the orbitals are relatively uh, 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 percentage orbitals character is relatively high. So you can use them as a basis of our LFTFT calculation. So similarly, if you take into consideration the D orbitals, which is the five D orbitals here, then you see also that the six D orbitals are, are not that uh, good as the 4F, we, are, we still have 66% and 33% of 5DC square, as you can see here, but you can still use it for the ligand field calculation. So uh, by calculating then the energies of uh, multiple energies of the 4F7 and also before the 4F651, we, did, we have obtained from uh, the LFTFT calculation, the following energy levels. And we see that uh, the ground state of the system is uh, exactly 4F7, this octet S7 half terms actually. And the first excited state is directly the blue from the three different functional. So it's not another 4F7 configuration, it's directly a blue 4F651 for each uh, uh, DFT uh, calculation as function of the TFT functional actually. So there is then a big possibility that in these compounds, we have a 4F5 four, four D transitions in terms of excitation or emission. And this is what we wanted to uh, calculate by also calculating the transition probabilities by obtaining the intensity of, uh, uh, of the transitions. And this is what we, we did here in, the, in this figure. So we calculated the transition probabilities from 4F7 to 4F651 and for, for three different functional. And we have here the PBE, which is then very in a very good agreement with experimental, or all of them are in good agreement of experimental with some slight energy shift for p 3 and LTA. But the PBE is, uh, is remarkably good, I, I have to say. Uh, oh, oh. Still have five minutes, I would say. So, and uh, the last uh, topic that I wanted to show you, but it will be very fast, is about X ray absorption spectroscopy. So, the mechanism of X ray absorption process is actually like we are using X ray to excite one electron from the core orbitals. For instance, here is lanthanide and Lanthanide system, and we are exciting one electron from the 3D orbitals, and this electron is then going to the valence, which is 4F uh, orbitals. And this interaction between the core electron 3D and the valence 4F give rise to uh, X ray absorption spectra. And uh, you can see here in this X ray absorption spectral profile that they are all different for all the lanthanide system. So we can basically use X ray to characterize. <coughs> Lanthanide system in uh, in practice, we, it is already uh, well known, and many people are using this for characterization of, uh, of a coordination compound based on lanthanide uh, uh, elements. 
we did this uh, uh, experimental and theoretical work in 2019, I think, yeah. And this is a molecular compound. You have a terbium and you have this double ticker, which is pheno uh, which is here. And the uh, uh, for excitation process is then exciting electron from the 3D orbitals to the 4F. So at the end of the day, we have this uh, 4F8 to 3D and 4F9 uh, transitions. And here is the X-ray absorption spectra we have uh, calculated in year, 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 and the experiments here, which is very close to the calculation. And we also did XMCD uh, calculation, and you see here in red and black the experiment and, and the calculated data, which are remarkably good also in this uh, context. So. Uh, now I'm going to say uh, a few words about future developments and the first uh, development that uh, that uh, we are uh, trying to do right now in collaboration with uh, Christian from Florida or Colorado nowadays is for the calculation of FF intensity. So earlier I told you that we can calculate the energies of the 4F, 4F transitions, like what we uh, what I showed for the 4F, uh, 4F interaction in europium three plus phenotrolling. But we also wanted to calculate the intensities and these intensities, is, these intensities are formally uh, forbidden because in terms of uh, electric dipole transitions, but it can gain intensities by mixing 4F with 5D or via vibrations or via non sotor symmetric coordination of ligands. And in this uh, example, we have this uh, samarium chronator compounds, and we have calculated with by using ligand field DFD uh, FF transitions that is uh, uh, occurring here in samarium uh, 2 plus. And here, here are the data that we obtained for uh, CN. Data is from a pure D5 optimized structure of these uh, compounds. And the magenta one is what you obtain when you just take the crystal structure out of uh, X ray diffraction techniques and just calculate it the transition from this crystal structure. And you see here uh, there are a big difference between these two kind of uh, input. And here is the experiments in red. What we what they they have uh, obtained from these compounds uh, from X-ray uh, 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 absorption spec X oh, sorry it's not X-ray but from uh, ultraviolet visible spectroscopy and you you, you can see that the, the, the blue and the magenta is also quite good actually but the energy levels are a bit uh, to say shifted I have to say but the blue spectra is uh, it, it's, it's, it's okay, okay, -ish, I will say to, re, to, to represent the experimental data. And here we have uh, the contribution of, uh, uh, especially for the optimized T5 uh, uh, structure, we have a contribution of uh, electric dipole and magnetic dipole at the same time. Actually, that gives rise to uh, transitions like, for, I think, for F1 here at least, and for F5 also, which is. Here, in uh, in, in this uh, in this uh, figure, but uh, this is one of the next development that we are uh, trying to do right now for the ligand field uh, TFT uh, calculation. And the next one will be the transition transition metal cage X-ray absorption spectroscopy. The cage X-ray absorption spectroscopy is uh, it looks like this. You can see here in this figure, for instance, for chromium compounds. And we are then the transition is like uh, the you have to excite one electron from the one s orbital of the chromium, and this one s orbital goes to the valence orbitals, which is then 3D and 4P. And in 3D, we might have some pre each that is here in the spectra, and the 4P is mainly the absorption edge that is the big. Uh, Big uh, jump here, that big peaks here that you can see in the in this spectra, and the one S four P is uh, electric dipole transitions, so it's it's uh, it's uh, strongly allowed. And uh, what you have here is a mix between the quadrupole and dipole transitions, actually. And we did this uh, in collaboration with uh, a group of uh, uh, Christophe Copere and uh, also uh, Alexander Kuda. 
uh, you can see here for different uh, coordination. If, it, if you take, for instance, a pure octahedral coordination of a chromium, then you have only a quadruple transition because there is no mixing between 3D and 4P. And you have here for, for bridge that you obtain for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of compounds, uh, this kind of system. And if you have a tetra tetragonal or structural system that is close to tetrahedral like here, then you have a mix between dipole and quadrupole. You have dipole because there is a possible mixing between 3D and 4P or P pairs of a chromium. And you have a different uh, profile for the pre -age. And we have also, you did it for real system here. Uh, in this uh, in this figure here, and uh, it, this is not a pure octahedral or tetrahedral system here, but a kind of a mixed in between them. And you see that uh, the theory, which is in black, have always a good uh, good uh, agreement with experimental experiments, which is then the dotted uh, green or uh, violet lines here. And the last uh, uh, development is about uh, resonant inelastic scattering. So the mechanism of the Rick's process is like this. So we, the ground state is always uh, uh, open shell, uh, like in this case, it's uh, actinide. So we have a five, five electrons. And then the, there is an intermediate state where we excite one electron from the 3D orbital like before. And this electron goes to the five, five orbitals or 6D, Balance orbitals of uh, actinide system, and this is an electric dipole transitions, and then uh, we are then probing the emission from the 4F to the 3D. So there is a, a hole in the 3D before in the intermediate state, and now there is uh, one electron in the 4F filling the hole that is in the 3D, and this is the emission process. So at the end of the day, we have this free electron configuration system involving 3D, 4F, and 5F orbitals at the same time. And to do the Riggs calculation, we uh, we we use the kramer eisenberg uh, formula. As you can see here, it's not really important that I say too much things about this right now, but just to say that uh, by uh, uh, calculating the cross section of uh, Rx, we can obtain a spectra that looks like this, which is a two dimensional spectra. We have uh, excitation and the emission in, uh, in in the axis, and then you have this map. And uh, if you trust, if you take a straight line in this, uh, in this uh, in, in the emission or in the excitation, then you can obtain the high resolution XANES profile that is in this case in, in, on top of the figure, as you can see here. And these are relatively close to what you obtain from the experiments. Actually, you can see here for this system, especially when you have uh, electron repulsion in, in also included in the calculation of this Uhanil bromide system as you can see here, so the two spectra, the cyan and black and the blue and the red are completely, are, are very good in terms of agreement. Um, this was basically what I wanted to say, and I'm sorry that I get five minutes more than expected. So uh, just to mention that we have now more than 20 years of development of LFDFT, so, we are very thankful to all the collaborators in Fribourg, also Paul Scherer Institute, and also in Mainz or uh, in, in Karlsruhe. So uh, we are so we are also very thankful for uh, to ADF for providing us the developer license for 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 ADF, and we use HPC uh, also all over Europe, especially the Karlsruhe PW Uni cluster and also the Dutch National Supercomputer Snellius uh, nowadays. And yeah, so this this was my talk, and um, uh, I think if you have question, we can go direct to the question right now, and then do this demo later. Or how do you say? No, I think it's a, it's a good idea. Thank you, Ari, for a very uh, exciting presentation on a, on a complex matter. Uh, no pun intended there. Uh, so, yeah, um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat now. And then later on, uh, Harry will give a short demonstration on how to actually set up and run these calculations and look at the results. Uh, so if you have any questions on, on what Harry presented so far, just put them in the chat because I don't think you will be able to 
uh, to talk just yet. I will keep that uh, for after the presentation. Then uh, you can also unmute okay. yourself. So in the meantime, Harry, uh, let's give everybody uh, some time to um, put any questions in the chat, but perhaps you can already start up the, um, the graphical user interface so we can... So for, 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 the, for the demo that I have chosen here is is is, is not, I mean, it's uh, it, it does not really take too many times, I would say. I okay. I made it well. very uh, quick yesterday as test, so hopefully, be but, well, my my uh, let's say experience is that whenever you have Zoom open, anything else will get slower. So you will find oh, okay. that the calculation will also get slower. But uh, well, let's see what happens. Um, so yeah. So in the meantime, yeah, we'll see if there's any questions coming up in the chat. So yeah. So I see a question from Franco. I'll re we'll read it out to you so you can continue uh, keeping your screen open. So the question is for the Euro, uh, Euro, European European complex, uh, is there any rationale why some levels are much better described with the hybrid functionals like PB0 uh, as opposed to PBE, but for other levels, um, there's not so much big of a difference? Uh, not really, actually. Uh, this is what I wanted also to say before uh, um, here. I just wanted to go back uh, yeah. here again. So um, uh, these levels are so sort of the main important factor in these levels is the spin orbit coupling and uh, uh, the ligand field actually because these are coming from the same set at F level so the electron repulsion is not really uh, important here in these uh, spectral terms. Um, <laughs> Um, we just uh, see that when you change the DFT functional, we are, especially when you, we use a hybrid functional, then we have a better uh, ligand field matrix actually. And when you use PBE, then this ligand field matrix is always uh, slightly overestimated than what we what, what we we expect. So the rationale yeah. will be that uh, from PBE to hybrid functional, we have a better description of the ligand field, and uh, that's why you have a better uh, better data here. But uh, you see that you can for instance, you can improve uh, the first excited state. You can improve uh, energy value here from. 27% error to 7% in PBE zero, but then there are some levels that is going going up in over direction. Like for instance, this one, which is starting from seven per, no, wait, uh, there are some levels that- uh, kind That of get worse when you go yeah. to a hybrid, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so for instance, the uh, 7F4, uh, you know, B and A state, state where you have the cursor there, I think they're with PBE zero slightly worse. Yes, then, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so unfortunately, there's no universal solution for all the states, right? So yes. these are notoriously difficult because you're dealing with two open shell uh, transitions or yeah. transitions from two open shell states yes. with F electrons. So especially the four F electrons, they're very tough to deal with. Yeah. Um, actually, so but there's another also question. Uh, oh, wait, wait, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's another question from the from the chat also on your uh, European complexes. So the the sandwich system that you showed on slide 28 does that exist? This. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We we have experimental data. We don't have experimental data, but there are experimental data based on these uh, these compounds. Yeah. Okay, and I mean, and so I don't, I, I, I don't know if it is a very, a very complicated compound or not. If it is, uh, it is stable in air or something like that. But they did experimental data based on this. Okay, yeah. So I, I guess that answers that question. So there is experimental data, but you don't have the comparison. Um, and then the other question is, what is the nature of the metal ligand interaction for the uranocene system? So for okay. uranium uh, sandwich system. Oh, did I say, so? oh, 
Uranium sandwich. Ah. No, I don't have uranium. Uranus and here, no, I do have an uranium example, which was in the Riggs calculation here, where you have this uranium system, yeah. Yeah. axial bound, and you have this uh, this equatorial ligand. Like, so in, in, in this system, you have a very close, uh, uh, how to say, we have a very close uranium oxygen uh, element here. So if the bond length is really short, 1.70 something. So it is a very covalent uh, interaction actually. And the ligand system here is rarely uh, ionic. So it's a very weak, uh, weak bond, bond actually. But I, I, I didn't do uh, bond analysis based on this compound. I just wanted to calculate for, for, for X-ray spectra, actually. Yeah. Okay. But but your your guess is based on the, the bond distance that uh, yeah. the uranium oxygen bond is very covalent. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I guess makes sense. Uh, and of course, you can always do other types of of analysis, right? So where yeah. you look at the covalency. And, and um, this is uh, this is for experimental crystal structure, actually. So yeah. Ah. Okay. You can't optimize it. Yeah. 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 So sorry. Yeah. So there's a follow up. Uh, uh, question from Lotfi or uh, perhaps uh, clarification. So um, he mentioned some years ago, uh, he was working with a hypothetic uranium C9H9 uh, sandwich complex. And he was wondering whether that would also exist. Um, that's uh, well, as a question, I guess, will be oh. difficult to, to answer, but. Um, so, um... So uranosin C, uranium C8H8 eight, eight exists. Yeah, yeah. But C9H9, I, I don't know actually. Uh, I have, I have no idea. No, okay. Sorry, sorry, we we don't know. So um, let's see. I don't think there's currently any other questions in in the chat. So perhaps we could switch over again to the the graphical user interface and just do a, see if we can do a quick demonstration. So what I'm proposing here for the calculation, calculation is actually to just take one uh, simple compound. So in principle, I always start with, uh, with IMS uh, input here, and I use all the, the database of ligands that is already available in the system. And for instance, I, we can take Chronator, which is small enough to run this in my uh, laptop, which is not powerful, <laughs> I have to say. And this is the ligand system that you are, we can consider here in the, in the structure. And just to replace the central atom here to some uh, uh, fusion metal system. Let's 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 try manganese because it was in the example that uh, that uh, I have shown in, in the talk. So we have this compound at the end of the day. Uh, we can check the bond length is about. 2.12, which is a bit longer, but perhaps we can do a pre-optimization, perhaps, just to see. Yeah, uh, let's just check the symmetry. D5H is okay. And now bond length should be around two. So two Longstrom, 204 picometer, it's, it's okay in this case. So the first thing is, we are first to export the coordinates because there is one thing that you have to do before you do the LFDFT calculation is to, so I just uh, uh, downloaded the coordinate here in my desktop. And one thing is just to take the manganese here, which is down in the atom list and put it up there in the atom coordinates list. So now we can uh, just, uh, we don't need to save this one and run again at the F input actually. Yes. And I import this uh, uh, coordinates that we just uh, 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 it did before. So here is our coordinates. So uh, uh, we, as I said before in the talk, we have to set up the occupation of uh, molecular orbitals so that uh, 
every orbitals that have uh, three D uh, characters has to be occupied with five over five, so one electrons, a fractional one electrons. And for we don't know what what are these orbitals, so what I recommend is to just to run a simple TFT calculation based on this cal uh, these compounds. Uh, important is to set up the charge first. So it's a connector is a neutral ligand. So it, it is the charge of a manganese. So it is two plus. And uh, we have to uh, run the calculation with a known frozen core. And my, to make it uh, quicker, I will do something here that is uh, a trick is just to set the uh, SCF uh, cycle to zero so that there is no, no SCF and also to set symmetry to no sim. So basically my system here is uh, only uh, done with uh, very few ATF keywords. And now I can save this as, uh, there's, there's no symmetry is always needed for the average of configuration. For the ligand field right? TFT, yeah. yes. For the ligand field TFT, yes. Yeah. Now I can uh, call it manganese ground state probably. So I didn't, I also uh, have it in my desktop. And now I, I can run this uh, simple uh, calculation, which is not, uh, which is there is no ACF convergence, so it will be very fast. So yeah, you see here the manganese in, is the first. So this is important also in the ligand field TFT calculation that we have this atom, this uh, uh, metal atom on top of the list. And there is no SCF, so that's why you have only one line here. And probably in one minute, it will be done. Well. <laughs> I told you it was going to be a little bit slower when you also have Zoom running. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now it's done now, yes. Uh, so this is not important. I mean, we just don't have ACF, so it's okay. But we can eventually check the output file and see if our metallic orbitals are available or not. So the list of orbitals are here, list of all IMOs. And it is no symmetry, so that's why you have the representation, which is A everywhere. But here are the, uh, the D orbitals. So starting from orbital number 70 to 74, and we have here all the characters, which is then quite good for ligand fit because more than 80% for every orbitals. But I mean, this is not optimized orbitals anyway, so it, but we can already say that this is good for the LFTFT calculation. So uh, orbital 69 is fully occupied with electrons, and this we have to now also from uh, the next step. So now what we need to do is then to go to the model here to set up for occupation and spin occupation. And in principle, it don't, it's already upload the occupation number that we have obtained from this uh, no SCF calculation. And you remember that uh, orbitals uh, number 70 to 74 are the D orbitals that uh, that we have seen before. So this has to be occupied by five over five electrons. So this is one. And we change this occupation to, to one like this. And just here in, in, in right, so orbitals number 70 to 74. Then now we can go to the ligand field TFT uh, panel, which is in properties. And we can define there the orbitals uh, that are the IMO in this of the orbitals that we are we are considering as the active subspace of a ligand field calculation. So this is 70, 71, 72, 3, and 4. And we are working on 3D orbitals, so 3 and uh, 2 for n and l value. And let's say we we don't use spin orbit coupling, uh, we just do it with a spin orbit coupling first. Um, so I, we just have to set this to zero, and now we can say we can save it again. 
the same. Yeah, it's okay. And we can run it. Now it might be, it might take a little bit longer. Oh, I have made a mistake that uh, you will see directly right now. I mean, we, we can can basically kill it. Let's kill it. You know, my mistake is we didn't go back to, to SCF and to put SCF cycle here. So let's say 50 instead of zero. I was too fast. Then save it again. And now we are safe. Okay, so so while this calculation is uh, is running, perhaps you could answer uh, another question. So yes. from from Jean Baptiste, who missed the beginning, um, so he asked which software is used to do ligand field DFT. So I replied, this is all done with ADF, and uh, there's the database of the Slater Condon uh, factors as well as uh, automatic use of of the uh, the Slater integrals and the spin orbit couplings. Okay. Um, which brings me to the question, right? Not all of the configurations are yet in the database, right? Or do we have all the open shell configurations for FF, DF, and SDF? Um, not all of them are included, right? Oh, we, we, right now we do have FF, ED, FF, yeah. and we have uh, FT for, yeah. uh, for FT transitions. And we have also a core electron excitation like 2P3D uh, or uh, or a 3D 4F configuration. Okay, yeah. So so there, there are quite a few, but uh, if there are some some missing, then yeah, probably best to contact you, Harry. I think. Yeah. Um, then a, a follow-up question is: uh, Can we use ligand field BFT to do water splitting? So perhaps you can make some comments on that. Oh. What does it mean, water splitting, uh, actually? Yeah, so uh, for instance, there can be some electrocatalysis where you, um, yeah, where you have different uh, transition metal complexes that, um, yeah, could react with water to generate hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, so in principle, uh, in this context, yes, yes, we, we can do it as as, so, as soon as we have a. Uh, an input, atomic structure input, like what we have here, for instance, then it should work, I would say. Yeah. yeah. But it's, uh, I, I guess, what we should say, it's it's just for single point energies, right? So yes, it's only uh, single point, yes. Yeah. So you cannot use it to uh, to optimize structures or transition states. Okay, yeah, sorry, uh, let, 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 let me... Not now our calculation is done. So here is the ADF part is done. And now also the ligand field here is also uh, uh, done with normal termination. So it's good. And we can always check again the uh, active space that we considered before. So it's orbital 70 to 74. And here is the list of uh, IMOs. And let's go to 70 to 74. here and you see that they are predominantly uh, uh, 3D of manganese, so 87 to 84, so more than 80%. So this is good for the ligand field calculation. And so this is our active space. And now if you go down to the ligand field uh, TFT output. So there are some uh, manipulation here that is important, but what is uh, that is not important, I wanted to say, but what is important is uh, a summary of the parameters that we have calculated for these compounds. And here we have the slatter condom uh, integrals, which is then F2, F4, only uh, available for this configuration. The spin or pin coupling is zero because we set it to zero before. We didn't consider it in the calculation. And then here is the ligand field uh, potential, which is almost diagonal with a small, with a small, very small of diagonal terms here, only in, in this uh, in these columns, this one and this one. Uh, we have also there in the calculation implemented uh, for calculation of a Chiton sore for the Kramer's tablet. So here we, uh, there are some uh, Kramer's tablet that 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 are that are 
that are here, but since spin orbit coupling is not involved in the calculation, we cannot really use this yet, uh, right now. We have to also to add the spin orbit coupling there, and we can rely on the G tensor. And here are the energy levels. You see that the ground state of uh, system is uh, with uh, six multiplicity, so it has a degeneracy of uh, six. And uh, here is the uh, expectation value of S square, S square and J square, and uh, S square is says that it's a six state state, and then comes some quartet states, probably from quartet J in this case, and then some tablet state, and so on and so forth. And here are the energies that is in uh, electron volt. And here are spectral terms analysis. So the first level that I said before is a six fold degenerate is 100% stacked S term from the atomic manganese two plus. And then the next level is a mix between quartet G, quartet P and quartet F actually, as you can see here, 50, 20, 27. And then we have also some tablet state coming probably here. And you see that there is no mixing between quartet and tablet because there is no spin orbit coupling. And if spin orbit coupling is there, then there will be a slight mixing between quartet and tablet states here in the, in the spectral term analysis. Uh, what I propose now is to do the same calculation with a spin orbit coupling so that uh, we can proceed with a calculation, for instance, of X-ray absorption spectroscopy later on. So uh, I just switch on spin orbit coupling by changing this factor from zero to one, as uh, you can see here. And then I save, uh, I will save, the save to, the same, to the same name like this. And I run it again, and then we can go back to the question again then. Uh, do you have a question, Fedor, in the chat? Or... Uh, yeah, so, uh, the, well, from, from not for the question, if you could follow up with him, I, I, I have the email address on the, um, the sandwich complexes with the C9, H9, uh, but yeah, that's for, for later on. And then uh, the question, does ligand field DFT, uh, do ligand field DFT calculations improve the description and the nature of metal ligand ground state interactions in F complexes. So do you get a better ground state description as well? So, um, uh, uh, oh God, uh, can you just uh, repeat again the question because I didn't really get. So, so when you do ligand field DFT, do you yes. get a better description of the ground state itself when you have F uh, electron complexes? Yes, as yes, if you have at, at least when you don't have too much covalence system. Because if you have a you have a strong covalency, then you have also to consider charge transfer there in the system. And we don't have this in the ligand field DFT approach yet. So for the example that I have shown you before in the in the in the way of the talk, they are LFTFT is good for the calculation of, uh, of the ground state, yes. Okay, thanks. Ah, it's, it's, it's done now for the spin or pit coupling. So I think we don't need to, I just wanted to show you the spin or pit component when you... When you have spin or pit component and... Uh, um, um, okay, we can go. Uh, we can go again. Go back to the question. I just wanted to change one one thing here because uh, here in the LFTFT we have this parameter which is called degeneracy threshold, and it is quite small, uh, quite uh, quite big here. Actually, that's why the six state S ground state of uh, of uh, manganese is not resolved. So let's say we change it to ten power minus six. I will say. Five, six, like this, and save it again. Yeah. Also, the spin orbit coupling is relatively small, of course, in the in the yes, 3D complexes. Yes. yes. So we'll, we'll more quickly see uh, the breaking of the, the the spin symmetry in the in the lanthanides yes. and mm -hmm. the Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I will just show you the output for energy levels that you obtain from this, and then we have 
probably five minutes just to show you how do we calculate X-ray spectra from the same compounds. And then the demo will be done, I will say. Sounds good. Yeah, we have always to do multiple run because we never know what is, you know, you run something, we forget, for instance, before we forget the SCF has to set up to more than zero. So <laughs> this is always important that, uh, that uh, we check the calculations, all the parameters, if they are really good or not. But I think with this uh, threshold, we will see if uh, uh, zero feet splitting of a 60 S uh, a level of manganese that uh, that we have seen before in the without spin or pit coupling calculation. Yeah, now it's done. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to go quickly to the output then. And you see here, so most of the levels are now uh, Kramer's tablet everywhere to to but the genesis is two because of a threshold that we have considered there. And you see the ground state, which is before sected S, has split into three uh, manifold. And these are these are all tab Kramer's tablet. And this is a very, very small zero field splitting that is in the sixted A uh, uh, crown state with a spinner bit coupling of manganese that you can obtain it here in in uh, in uh, left EFT. So what I'm proposing right now is to use this uh, crown state calculation as a initial state of an X-ray absorption calculation of this of the same compounds. So I just want to go back to the to the model here, and what is important now to do is to go to the spin and occupation, and here you see we have a, we have, we have a, a list of orbitals and the electronic transition that we want to calculate is like transition from 2p to 3d. So we have to find out of this list the 2p orbitals. So the first one here is for sure 1s orbitals of manganese. Then the second one is 2s orbitals of manganese. So the, the third, fourth, and fifth one will be then the 2p orbitals of manganese. So here we have to, to change this occupation from six in total to five. So I just set there five over three. And then I have to put the additional electrons in the 3D orbitals, which is then from 70 to 74. So it comes now with uh, six over five, which is 1.2. No, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, 1.2. <laughs> and so if you're not sure exactly indeed, uh, which is the orbital level of the, um orbital you're exciting from, you can always go back to the output yeah, or, yes. or click on ADF levels and then yeah. you can also view. You, you, you can mm -hmm. go to the ADF levels actually, and you can yeah. check this three, four, five here. I just say three, four, yeah. five, because we know that there is only one S and two S. In, in this case, it's clear because the manganese orbitals are much deeper, so yeah. Yes, yeah. And now we have changed the occupation to the following, and now we just go to the ligand field. And basically we just need to uh, get all these IMOs to the second shell. So here it becomes three, two, and here is one. So one spin orbit coupling. And in the first shell, we have to place then the P or two P orbitals of manganese. And we know that it is three, four, and five orbitals, three, four, and five. And this is two. P orbital, so two and one and one zero like this. And here is, uh, we want to calculate the excitation. So we have to put, provide the ADF uh, tip 21 file for the ground state. So we just uh, need to click there to the ground state manganese ADF RKF, just provide yeah, it so here. The type 21 has, has become RKF, so. Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, still used to the, to the older uh, denomination, yeah. But yeah. now it's it, it's there, 
I think everything that we have defined so far stays. So everything is correct. I'll go back to main the same. So we just need to save it, save as, uh, uh, let's say XIS. Then we save it. And now we can run XIS. Okay. Okay, now it's going to the SCF cycle. So these are typically a little bit more difficult to converge, right? Or they can be more difficult. Oh, no, this is also, I mean, the, the two P orbitals are very localized too, and there is almost no orbitals there next to them. So we can easily populate the two P orbitals with five over six, uh, five over three electrons. And the D was quite fast before, so it should be fa it should be good also, I would say. Yeah, I see it's, it's actually converging already, so yeah. Okay, now it has convert and now it is going to do the uh, ligand field calculation now. Now it is done. Um, we don't need to go to the output anymore, but we can go directly to idea uh, spectra. So uh, uh, here is our, uh, our spectra. So you have to go to league and field DFT and select the excitations. And here you can see the uh, XI spectra of these compounds that we have uh, 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 built before. And you have this, this is the IL3H and this is the IL2H. And these two peaks is because of, uh, these two bands are because of a spin orbit coupling of a 2P electrons, which is quite large. That's why you observe these two bands. And we have here all the details of the transitions. And we can also go to, MCD, but okay for MCD, I have to just tell you. Uh, so I I, I just uh, click on MCD here, but here there is no uh, magnetic circular dichroism because we didn't introduce magnetic field in the ligand field calculation. So you see the black and red completely is completely the same actually as you can see here in the in the spectra, but. I don't want to do the magnetic circular dichroism now, but if you, if you want to do it, it's, uh, possible. <laughs> it's possible. And the way to do That's it is to define yeah. to define here in the in the LFDFT uh, panel the magnetic field as you can see here. So you can put, for instance, one Tesla along the side uh, axis. Then you put it here in here in, in the last one. Then you can obtain magnetic circular dichroism out of uh, LFDFT calculation. Great. Uh, so I think this was a very helpful demonstration as well. So um, I know you prefer to do things from the command line. So it's uh, it's good that you <laughs> managed to do it from the graphical interface. So um, it, so now you know you can do both. Uh, let's see. So I, I made it possible for people if they want to uh, just ask the questions via the audio. Uh, it's possible now to unmute yourself. So go ahead. If you have any questions, you can still uh, type them in the chat as well. So let's see if there's any any questions. And otherwise, um, yeah, people can can always uh, 
yeah, contact us and, and uh, if they get started with it, I'm sure that there will be other questions as well. So, okay, yeah. So, question is: Can we have the recording? Yes, I, I will uh, try and upload it um, on YouTube. Uh, so, on the SCM YouTube channel. Uh, uh, I will also I will also send you my talk, and it will it can it can you can yep. put it there also. Yes. Great. Yeah. So then I will link on the SCM website to the slides and the inputs and the, and the, the video as we've uh, uploaded it. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, uh, so Lotfi says uh, thanks to you. And so I'll put you two in contact as well. Um, and so maybe you have some nice collaboration from that. And then, um, yeah, let's, let's just, uh, stop here and see if there's any other questions we can take them uh, some other time so thank you again Harry for a very thorough uh, presentation and demonstration and uh, thank you all for listening in bye bye bye